Hello everyone, thank you for attending our webinar today on how to eliminate the mainframe security gap with Bob Thomas and Stu Henderson. My name is Yvonne Wheaton and I represent the marketing department at Software Diversified Services. I will be your moderator today. Here's what your dashboard should look like. This may be familiar to some of you. You'll find any handouts for this presentation on your dashboard under the handout section. You can access and download these at any time during the webcast. We'll have a Q&A session at the end of the webcast. If you have any questions at any time during the webinar, please send them to us in your question box. If you still have questions or would like to get in touch with us after this webcast, you can send us an email to info at stsusa.com or 1-800 443-6183 by telephone. When you leave this webcast, there'll be a brief survey presented to you. I hope you'll take a few minutes to fill it out. It's my pleasure to introduce Bob Thomas from Enterprise Systems Media. Bob Thomas is the CEO and founder of Enterprise Systems Media and the publisher of the Enterprise Executive and Enterprise Tech Journal magazines. For over 30 years, Enterprise Systems Media Inc. has been serving the information needs of IT professionals at Fortune 500 size enterprises throughout the world. You can register at Enterprise Systems Media for their free monthly magazine and journal. Stu Henderson, since 1990, he has directed his own firm, The Henderson Group, which provides computer security consulting and training in a variety of technical areas. Mr. Henderson is an experienced consultant who specializes in effective computer security for IBM mainframes, Unix, and Windows. His website, stuhenderson.com, provides a wealth of free information, including articles and newsletters for information security and IS audit staff. If You will find his information in the handout section as well. Colin Vandeross is a senior systems engineer here at SDS. He has over 25 years experience as a customer at a large bank as their network systems programmer responsible for network transfer and security file solutions. He's been at SDS now for over eight years, focused on network software solutions and security solutions. So here's our agenda today. Bob Thomas will be setting the stage for us by sharing the results from a very recent 2017 system information event management survey. He has some current information about SIM enterprise status from the latest ESM survey. Following Bob, Stu Henderson will be discussing SIM and the evolution to security information and event management and some ideas as to what you could track in today's SIM enterprise environment. Following Stu, Colin Vandeross from SDS will be discussing Smart ZOS Agent for SIM and how you can use alerts and reveal pertinent events. Following Colin, we will have our Q&A session. All right, so give me a few minutes of your time to tell you about SDS. SDS, or Software Diversified Services, has been providing mainframe solutions to the market for over 35 years. Our headquarters are located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. SDS now supports over 20 ZOS, MVS, VSE, and ZVM mainframe systems products. Our flagship products are dedicated to network management, security solutions, and performance solutions. SDS is a leading provider of enterprise infrastructure software for multiple platforms with a 35-year history of delivering award-winning support and customer-centric IT infrastructure solutions. We have over 1,000 licensed customers worldwide, including Global 500 companies. SDS has focused on bringing software solutions to the market that provide considerable cost savings to you and your enterprise while still using elegant and state-of-the-art functionality. We are invested in our security portfolio, which includes Smart or Security Monitor Real-Time. The Smart product is a SIM essential for ZOS mainframe and as a part of Software Diversified Array of Security Enterprise Product Offerings. You can stay connected with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and our blog for tips, ideas, and white papers. Okay, so let's get started. It's my pleasure to hand the webinar over to Bob Thomas from eSystems Magazine. Bob? Thank you, Yvonne. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. We recently conducted the 2017 Security Information Event Management Survey to gain insight into the implementation and use of security information and event management solutions due to the ever-increasing number of attempted and successful security breaches. Let me show you some of our findings now. We first asked our readership which is comprised of IT management and IT technicians located throughout the world, 
If their company had an enterprise security information and event management solution in place, just over half, or 52.6%, indicated that they indeed had an enterprise SIM, that's pronounced SIM, it's S-I-E-M, but it's pronounced SIM, in place to monitor for security happenings on an overall basis for the company. We then asked our readers to tell us what solution they were using for their enterprise SIM needs, and you can see they have chosen some of the best and well-known solutions available. We then drilled down a little deeper to see if they had implemented any SIM solutions to manage security events on these EOS systems, and were greatly surprised to learn that only 16% of the residents responded with a yes, and only an additional 8% responded with a not yet, but we are actively working to get a SIM solution in place. An astounding 41% directly answered, no, they don't have a SIM solution in place for their ZOS system, and 35% didn't know at all. In other words, 76% of the respondents answered no or we don't know, yet 53% said they had an enterprise SIM in place. Why do more than half of the respondents have an enterprise SIM in place but not one for their mainframe? Do most IT professionals honestly believe that a SIM solution isn't needed for ZOS because it is unnecessary for whatever reason? So we asked those who answered yes, those who answered not yet but we are working on it, and those who answered no or don't know, separate sets of questions to see if we could learn more. First we will look at those respondents who answered yes, we have a ZOS SIM solution in place. To reiterate, only 16% of respondents said they have a SIM solution in place for ZOS. Here is how those 16% who answered yes, they have a SIM solution in place, ranked their SIM solution requirements. Incident detection, real-time threat analysis, and collecting and correlating security events were at the top of their list. Now let's see what insight those who answered not yet, but we are working on it, can give us. Just a quick reminder, only 8% of respondents answered, not yet, but we are working on it to get a ZOS SIM solution, while only 16% said they had a SIM solution in place for ZOS. Now let's look at how those who answered, not yet, but we are working on it to get a ZOS SIM solution in place. As you can see, 67% of those who answered, not yet, but we are working on it, are currently using SAF, SMS, or both IDS and SAF SMS security reports, while 33% are using some other means of monitoring their security events. Yet all of them obviously also identify that those solutions are not satisfactory because they are actively working to implement a ZOS SIM solution. Of those who answered, not yet, but we are working on it, you can see how strongly the IT and compliance departments are pushing for a SIM solution, with business management also showing a fairly strong interest and the same three SIM solution requirements are in the top three of their rankings, just like those who answered yes to already having SIM solution in place for ZOS. Now let's see how those who answered no or don't know answered some questions. Again, 41% directly answered no to having a ZOS SIM solution in place. Those who answered no or don't know are using IDS and both IDS and SAF SMS security reports, just like those who answered no, but we are working on it. The difference is that those who answered no or don't know don't understand the need for a ZOS SIM solution, their risk of not having such a solution, or they don't believe it's a problem. Here is where the difference might reside between those who answered yes, those who answered no, but we are working on it, and those who answered no or don't know. As you can see, 81% of the respondents who answered no or don't know about having a ZOS SIM solution in place are not aware of a group or groups pushing to get SIM for ZOS. Of those who answered yes, they are aware of a group or groups pushing to have a ZOS SIM solution. It appears there will hopefully be more companies moving to the no, but we are working on it group, which is good. However, there is still a significant number of companies that do not have a ZOS SIM solution in place to protect what is probably their most important or one of their most important systems of record. Are they waiting for a breach to occur? Do they believe that ZOS is bulletproof security-wise? 
it is a definitely an interesting set of questions. Thank you for listening to my presentation today. Now I will pass the floor back to Yvonne. Thank you for your time today and for listening to my presentation of our SIM findings. Thank you, Bob, for talking with us today about SIM enterprise environments. So without further ado, I would like to turn the presentation over to Stu Henderson. Stu? Thanks, Yvonne, and thanks everyone for taking the time to listen. I'd like to talk a little bit about the evolution to SIM, that's security, information, and event management. We've had a lot of threads develop over time and come together, and we can learn some opportunities for what we can do with this coming together of all these threads. So we'll talk in three steps. We'll give a little bit of history about the threads and how they came together. Then we'll talk about what they let us do now. We'll wrap it up with a summary and a call to action. In the past century, we started managing information security. We did this by looking at logging and monitoring of events that occurred, like password violations. On the mainframe, to do this, we used SMF data. And then there were also other logs on the mainframe for USS, TCP IP, and others. On distributed platforms like Unix and Windows, there were various logs that we also took advantage of. Still in the past century, we were trying to figure out security on the computer was new stuff. And we were trying to figure it out, so we fiddled with stuff that we could record and, and monitor. And while this was going on, the auditors start, started telling us that you're supposed to review the violations report every day. So we started doing this, and we got a violations report. Sometimes there were hundreds or thousands of violations a day. And the big question that came up, of course, was, so what? Because the security administrator very often did not have the authority to do anything other than review the report. And so it really made no difference. It wasted paper and gave everybody a headache. And so we looked for better information. While this was going on, the TCP admi IP administrators were learning about a lot of things like intrusion detection and packet filtering. And one of the things they did was they built firewall rules that had more than one condition. So they could say, I want you to allow or deny something if, for example, the two IP address is some address, and the two port number is some port number, and the direction is inbound, and the from IP address is da 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 da. So the combination of all these conditions made it possible to allow or deny with a, a lot more precision. While this was going on at the same time, data analysts were developing more reporting tools. And there were histograms, frequency charts, linear regression. There's a whole slew of things, even including pie charts. And data mining, the idea of drawing conclusions out of vast amounts of data if you only knew how to analyze it. And also the question of statistical quality control. This was the idea that you could establish control intervals of what was acceptable for certain measurements and then uh, just have flagging or violation reporting only when something came outside of the control intervals. So uh, for example, instead of a listing of just uh, violations one after another, we could uh, combine things on different axes, look at different trends. Here's an example of a report that was used to measure a, an edit program to meter, measure how much CPU time it uses and how many reads and writes it uses, depending on whether the volume of input, whether there's one input update record, or two, or 50, or 500. And um, you might have some questions in your mind if you look at this graph. Actually, something like this has happened in real life, and it led to someone discovering a, a major flaw in the program. And you could also see how this might be useful feedback for capacity planning as well as for security issues. We had new ways to report, exception reporting and pattern and trend identification, uh, alerts if we had spikes in activity or interesting correlations relating one value to another. And again, the question of control intervals. We were able to establish ranges that of values that were acceptable and then set up things so we only got 
an alert or a report if something fell outside the control interval. We had more new ways to report lots of different things instead of just password violations or data set accesses. We could report, for example, with TCP IP the number of inbound messages that came from outside the firewall, which would mean outside our organization, and those that came from inside the firewall, that is, just within our internal network. We also uh, had reporting against uh, use of firewall or emergency break the glass privileged user IDs. And uh, at the same time, the fraud examiners were discovering how to develop patterns, how to interpret them, how to understand the value of identifying outliers. And the fraud examiners were also learning techniques for uh, figuring out where to look. For example, they discovered in banks that if you had a dormant account, that is maybe uh, some old person who wasn't doing any trading or, or any deposits of checks, but just had a big savings account, if all of a sudden there was activity against that account, it turned out that this was, uh, in some cases, an indication that someone was fraudulently drawing information out of an account that the owner of the account apparently was not paying attention to. So fraud examiners learned where to direct their attention. The smart auditors and the security administrators were learning stuff at the same time. They were learning how to collect information on what is happening in order to know how to tighten up the rules safely without upsetting production. They were also learning the importance of comparison to some standard that you couldn't evaluate security or whether controls were working unless you had a standard to compare against because if you looked at minimum password length or number of password violations or whatever, if you just expressed an opinion, something subjective, it wouldn't stand up to scrutiny and everybody would have a different subjective opinion. So we determined that we needed to establish firm standards to compare against. While all this was going on at the same time, the end users, the people in the business operations, were learning that there were measurements that could come from the computer that would help them manage their work. The only problem was they didn't know what to ask for, and the IT staff didn't really know what they needed, and so uh, there were some opportunities that got missed because the two sets of knowledge didn't get merged. So all of these threads finally, over time, came together. The mainframe SMF and the other logs and so on, including the input and the techniques that everyone was developing, and this all came together to give us SIM, security, information, and event management. Consolidated management of information about what's happening regarding security, but you're going to see that uh, there's some other applications for this that are just additional fallout that we get here. Well, with that as history, let's talk about what we can do. One of the things you can do is vary the types of item you report when you collect information about security-related events. Instead of reporting just violations, you could report successful accesses to data sets and resources. And you might note changes in trends over time. You're going to see more and more often it's the discrepancies, the changes in trends, the spikes that give us useful information. What would it mean if unexpectedly some program reads a customer master file using a, a user ID that isn't the normal production user ID to be accessing that file. What might it mean if some month the accounts payable master file was updated 99 times more often than most months? What might it mean if the number of uncertified production access permissions suddenly increased? Or if the volume of outbound FTP data suddenly jumped? And when you think about some of the uh, sensitive information that has been hijacked from computer systems and ended up in the newspapers, uh, that gets really interesting. You might vary the correlations between two or more items. And the fraud examiners, for example, uh, used to, or uh, still do, sometimes compare the number of purchase orders to the number of invoices received, and they compare this to the number of checks issued to pay the invoices. What would a change in these ratios indicate? And what if they did it instead of the number of invoices, they reported the dollar value, or how often they occur, or time of month, or day, or week?
You can also vary how you report the information, their listings, trends, exceptions, outliers, and so on, and correlations, how well two numbers track each other. And you can actually get measurements called the correlation coefficient. Uh, I know of one brokerage firm that was using the number of shares traded on the New York Stock Exchange to predict their CPU usage. And then when they looked more closely, they discovered that a better predictor, there was better correlation, if instead of using the number of shares traded, they used the number of trades, which was also available information, and turned out to be a better predictor of C CPU requirements. Uh, sometimes what you want for a report is, is not a report, but you want a phone text or an email just telling you either there's no significant change or alerting you if there is something that needs immediate attention. attention. Here's an example of another way you could do reporting. In this case, we're looking at FTP volume, that is file transfer uploads and downloads of data in some very large unit of, of measurement. And we've got two separate charts, one of them for volume inside the firewall, that is inside our internal network, and the other is for volume outside the firewall, that is outside our organization's network, perhaps even from another country. And here we're breaking this out by day of the week, which could lead us to at least uh, some interesting questions, if not deliberate conclusions. We can also vary how often you have to look at the reports. Instead of a list of violations, you could get an email uh, per week summarizing things like that. Or you could receive a report only on an exception basis. That is, when there's something that's outside the definitions of what you've uh, determined to be normal or control intervals. You can vary the purposes and the audiences. Of course, we think first of security administrators, auditors, fraud examiners, the compliance department, but a lot of this reporting can also be useful to marketing and sales and inventory and finance, hardware capacity planners, service level agreement evaluators, people who are addressing software quality assurance, and the problem management team can all benefit from the reporting you can get from a, a useful SIM application. Which brings us to a big question here. Should you include the mainframe in your SIM logging and reporting? Now, it's a cliche. It is almost any organization with a mainframe is going to have the essential data kept on the mainframe, but very often there will be distributed computers, Unix or Windows, facing the Internet. So queries from the Internet come into these Unix and Windows computers, which are not able to hold all of the essential information or to process the volume of transactions. So they pass the information over the internal network to the mainframe, or they transfer uh, information or queries the mainframe comes back with the information, and the Unix and Windows computers then pass this on. Now, a, a lot of people say you could save a lot of uh, money and uh, security problems and reliability problems if you got rid of the distributed boxes and ported all of the applications on them to the mainframe. That's a, another issue for another time. But that's certainly something to think about, and some of the SIM reporting that you can get would help you do that analysis. But right now, let's just stick with the main question. Should the mainframe be included in the SIM logging and reporting? And the way we're going to do this, like Willie Sutton, the bank robber, we're going to say, where's the money? So if you want to allocate resources for any project, including management of your enterprise IT operations, your starting point is to say, where are the most valuable assets? The customer master file, the general ledger, the accounts payable, all of the critical, essential information and processing capability. If this is not, if your main, most valuable assets are not on the mainframe, don't bother including the mainframe in the SIM. In fact, maybe you should consider selling your mainframe or getting rid of it. But if you discover that your most important, valuable assets are on the mainframe, then it, it would be silly not to include the mainframe in your SIM reporting because you want to take advantage of this tool to protect your most valuable assets. So here's the challenge for you. 
just to think about this with a mainframe. Given all the different things you can measure and report and monitor, and there's a lot of this and there's a lot of creativity that you can uh, provide to develop more things that you can measure, report, and monitor. But here's the challenge. What control information would you want that makes use of combining data from the mainframe with data from your distributed computers. That is, if you take the SMF log and the other log files on the mainframe, if you could somehow connect and correlate this with the log files from your distributed computers, what sort of information could you pull from this and how could you take advantage of it? How could you make this be useful information? You don't want to silo your information sources. If you've got a mainframe that's connected to the internet, you've got internal computers connected to the in internet uh, and uh, through the uh, internal network to your mainframe, you also have uh, com distributed computers outside your organization that are coming through the internet to your internal network to your mainframe, including customers and, and programmers and sometimes organizations in other countries. So here's a hint to the challenge. Remember the challenge is, what information would you want to collect and how would you want to report it if you were able to combine log information from the mainframe with log information from distributed computers? Here are two hints. First, each message has information that will tell you whether it's inside your firewall or outside your firewall, both the to and the from addresses. And sometimes this information will even tell you what country the message is coming from. So you can identify all of the uh, activity that's coming through your internal TCP IP network and immediately identify for each message the to or from address, whether they are inside your firewall, which means it's entirely within your internal network, or outside your firewall. And then if you look for trends, spikes, outliers, discrepancies in ratios and counts and dollar values, uh, time of day or week, month, if, you're, if you follow this, I think you'll find there are some interesting possibilities for useful management tools that will help you address security as well as some of the other areas we've been talking about. Which brings us to our summary and call to action. You've got a choice. The extreme uh, options here are one, you can stick with what you may have started with, a listing of the violations from a single platform. And I can tell you from uh, a lot of observation, the people who have to review the list of violations get pretty bored and get uh, proof blind. They, sometimes they won't even notice stuff that's going by because there's so much boring information in the listing. Or if you want to do something different, you can form a team and make, get your best people, your most creative people, people with different sets of knowledge that uh, would pool their technical knowledge and their creativity, first to assess the reporting needs for security and other purposes and the opportunities that are there, and then creatively design SIM logging and monitoring to support all of the audiences and objectives, not just security. So, if it isn't you who does this, then who's going to? Thanks very much for your kind attention, and here's a little bit of uh, sources for more information. Thanks very much, and now back to you, Yvonne. Thank you, Stu. Today's consolidated management of security alerts and the evolution of SIM has come a long way. Next, Colin Vanderost from SDS will present a smart solution to detecting events in your mainframe. He'll be using smart data or security monitor alert real-time, providing real-time alerts. So I'll hand the presentation now over to Colin. Colin? Thank you, Yvonne, and thank you, Stu, for that insightful information on the SIM and what folks should be considering when they want to include a SIM or ZOS as part of their SIM strategy. So here is the agenda for my piece of the presentation. Uh, I'll be providing you with an overview of the smart product, so talk about the features, then go into some detail as to how the product works, what's the different sources where we collect information from, uh, briefly describe some of the problems that the product 
uh, or the problems that the smart product solves. Uh, talk about smart filtering. Uh, that is something also that Stu touched on. Uh, you know, this is uh, ZOS. There's a lot of records that you can report on, and uh, this is something that you would probably want to consult with other teams as well. And then a very short demonstration on how uh, you can send events using the smart product. And in this particular case, I am using the IBM Curator SIM. I am sending a few events to uh, that particular box. So let's get right to it. So the smart features, it works along with any of the SAF products that you have installed, whether it's RACF, ACF2, and Top Secret. The Syslog agent and the smart agents, they're very powerful tools and the smart agent works along with your mainframe system authorization facility and it uses intelligent data mining from several system sources. So messages written to the console and SMF events, including uh, DB2 auditing and bear in mind, this is all in real time. And this is going to be providing you with an additional level of mainframe security. It also monitors for internal activity by looking for patterns of abuse and defense against particular denial of service attacks. The smart product supports all operating systems, all operating systems, so whether it's 2.1, uh, 2.2, and Unix system services. So if you have a requirement to monitor any events that's occurring on uh, your Unix system service side of the house, that is certainly something that the product can do for you. The syslog agent focuses on console messages only and that's in real time but does not process the SMF records and the smart agent includes the syslog functionality. So both of these they share the same base code and it runs as a starter task which you'll see when I get to my live demo. The smart agents can process uh, in different LPARs and they're not required to have the same mainframe staff product. So perhaps uh, in your environment, you've uh, acquired new business and maybe there's a data center that's running ACF2 and you know a few others that's running RACF. That's no real problem. You can configure the agent to start up with whatever SAF product you are using. And this is all configured within one of the configura configuration members, which I'll be showing you in the live demo. The alerts are sent using a UDP, so user datagram protocol and these ports are assigned within that configuration member whenever an alert is sent uh, out to your enterprise sim. So there's a few ways that you can generate rules on the product. One would be to invoke a TSO uh, or on TSO there's an ISPF panel that you can use to generate rules so you can log on to this and you can set uh, you know what event should be captured using the smart product. Uh, when I get to the filtering piece, we can talk a little bit about that. Then maybe for the larger customers, perhaps there's so many rules and you don't want to do this using an interactive panel, you can use the batch rule generator and create some of these batch rules, you know, within batch run a batch job for all of these to be, to be populated into the smart product. One thing to mention is when we do this right now, the agent has to be down. So when you invoke the changes, you'd have to recycle the starter task. There is plans though to include uh, or to make this more dynamic so when you implement the rules you don't have to recycle the agent but for now that is something that you have to be in mind. Then there is also a batch feed of SMF records so this I think is pretty exciting or pretty cool. Um, you can recover events from an archive uh, from any events that have been archived you know SMF events so even although maybe right now you don't have a ZOS SIM collector or you're not sending events from ZOS to your enterprise SIM, but let's assume you maybe want to go back a year or two and you want to see what transpired maybe a year ago, you can take those archived SMF records, feed it through the product and we can give you some insight as to what occurred a year or two ago. So that's something that is possible to do on the product. Then the alerts, they delivered from the mainframe agent to your UDP SIM, uh, to a UDP SIM or to an IDS. So that is possible on the product as well. So what problems does the smart product solve? Um, I remember when I used to work at, the, at a bank and uh, one of my functions was to run reports. Uh, I would take the SIS1 man files and then dump them, uh, you know, make, uh, make those 
to make the data available so I could run the batch reports against the information that was stored in those sys1.man files and I remember that was pretty, uh, pretty tough to do, um, you know, a very e tedious task. But if you've worked with them, you know that those SMF logs, they may be over 32K in length. Uh, the ZOS SMF logs, they're also in binary format. Um, and console messages and write to operator messages, they scroll really, you know, off the terminals faster than that can be read. And it's probably not the most efficient way for you to keep tabs of what's happening on your network or on your system and I know console logs from my experience they are seldom reviewed for security and compliance or auditing uh, most times when I had to refer to those it was more from a problem determination point of view going back to figure out what happened on that particular term so what the problem does uh, what the smart does do that log consolidation it makes it a lot easier so these events are reported to you in real time you don't have to go about dumping records any longer or sys one man files. You're going to be able to report these events in real time if you do consider the solution. It improves the efficacy of RACF, ACF2 and top secret and also non-security uh, SMF types and also console messages. Um, I was just relaying this story to a friend of my, a colleague of mine in the office uh, away when I worked at the bank and if you you know you edited or you try to save something that you weren't authorized to do and you'd get that that reddit ICH 408i message I remember a week or two later you'd get this message via the internal mail and you had to explain what your intent was to update that particular data set two weeks later I, I can barely remember what I did yesterday uh, I mean I couldn't remember you know what I did at the time but most times it was never any accurate information that I put in those into those responses uh, but with this product you know this is all real time you're going to get that message uh, and based on how you set up your sim you know those messages can go immediately out to that person and saying hey what is your intent uh, so this is going to make that process so much more easier it is real time delivery you'll see that in a minute or two when I do the live demo uh, we use the state of the art capture for the alerts uh, so um, that is something that is built into the product when you install it it's all uh, there's a subsystem interface that gets initialized I think I have a slide or two talking about that in a second or two and it also tracks those DB2 audited events and then there are also a bunch of APIs that the product comes with uh, that uh, you can use to maybe do some additional customer customization for some of those events that are very important to you or your site. Smart enables the extension of mainframe console messages and write to operators to be routed to the external log retention service servers. The easy integration with centralized service activities within the enterprise sim. Uh, so that's also a really easy. It's just a matter of getting the product running on the mainframe and you can send those messages off to your enterprise sim and it is a cost effective solution to uh, monitor IBM ZOS as part of the enterprise wide security program. So where does SMART get its data from? So primarily from SMF records. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit about filtering uh, later on in this presentation. Then we also get information from the DB2 audit SMF records um, those SMF 102s, I'm sure for folks on the call that are familiar with those, that's where we can get some of that information. And also from right to operator messages, this is primarily where we get this information from. The smart SMF exits, they capture these events in real time. Uh, all of these right to operator messages from the Alpha enter the smart supplied subsystem interface. So this SSI gets initialized when the starter task comes up and this is all done you know under the covers as the starter task gets initialized. So it runs as a starter task as I mentioned on all the Alpha's you want security events reported on. Perhaps uh, at your site you only maybe you have 10 or 12 Alpha's and two of them are sandboxes you're not really interested in recording events on them. So you would just run, you know, the starter task on all of the LPARs where you want that visibility. <coughs> Excuse me. We use the industry standard uh, UDP. So that's something you'll see as well in the live demo. And you can send events to multiple destinations. So from a resilience or redundancy point of view, 
if uh, your enterprise or your organization has more than one SIM, you can code it up inside of the product. Just code the IP addresses where these need to be forwarded to and that'll take care of that redundancy. If ever one of those SIM monitors are down, you're guaranteed of getting the information still to one of them. Another nice feature, you can write to DASD, so perhaps you want to view this information uh, in a log, you know, this information can be written to DASD and there is also user SMF records that is supported on the product. So essentially you configure to write security messages on the syslog and the SIM uh, monitor of your choice, so whatever it is, Splunk, ArcSat, Curator, and then we will do that and the product also does support the different um, formats, in this case for what I'm doing be using for IBM Curator, uh, we I've coded it up to use the leaf format, so that is something that is supported in the product. Okay, this is a little bit detail, a little bit of detail on the application program interfaces. So there is a batch API. Uh, one example I can cite is perhaps you interested any time a batch job runs where there's a large deposit of maybe over ten thousand dollars the using the batch API you can write it up so that you can be alerted when that particular type of transaction takes place so that's just an example on how you could exploit the batch API then there's also a kicks API and there you can see uh, some of the detail about that the standard call is made from the application program and all of this is clearly documented in our install and customization guides so as you mentioned earlier in his presentation, you probably find that a lot of folks are using enterprise systems. Maybe they're getting information from firewalls, routers, from Unix systems and Windows, and maybe ZOS is not part of, or hasn't been included as yet, as part of your SIM strategy. If that is the path, or you have made that conscious decision to uh, start sending events, um, if there's really important information like Stu was mentioning, you may want to then consider including ZOS as part of that mainframe strategy and send that information from ZOS all the way to your enterprise SIM. And this is just an example uh, how you could have LPARs all over the country running the, uh, an agent on those LPARs and sending events to your enterprise SIM. Okay, let's talk about some of the filtering on the smart product and I'm sure for the ZOS folks that's on this call today, you know there's so much information or there's so many SMF records that you can turn on. Um, a funny story I can cite is I was testing a product once and I decided to enable all of the SMF records to see what data I could get from it and it was running on my sandbox. Uh, needless to say, the next day I got a call from uh, one of the guys that looked after Mix saying, hey, what have you done on the system? Why am I getting almost three times the amount of data? So um, that, needless to say, I wasn't a very popular guy when that occurred. But talking about filtering, this is something that you would have to decide what you want monitored. Out of the gates, we don't recommend you turn on everything. We have a base sample that uh, gets shipped with the product and, um, you know, some of the minor events are turned on but this is also something that you would have to work with some of the folks in your team. Uh, you probably heard of the terminology or the term called segregation of duties where if you did go down this path and now you're deciding to send events from ZOS all the way to uh, your, your SIM, you would probably need to get all the different teams involved, so maybe your network team, your security team, maybe some folks on the um, operations side where you as a team sit down together and you figure out what it is or what's important to monitor and it'll be one of those things that will probably steadily grow and grow as you figure out what is important and what is not important to you. So here yeah, a little bit of detail about the levels of filtering when it comes to uh, the smart product. Within the MVS facilities the SMF exits accept only the requested SMF types uh, for security types we accept only the requested events and then the subsystem interface accepts only requested right to operate the messages and that's both for single and multi-line messages. Within the smart address space there are rules for users, files, devices and messages. 
one thing to bear in mind it's also possible to set threshold triggers so that's pretty nice because uh, it allows you to set appropriate thresholds and you don't have to act on those false positives and that is something that is possible to do on the product again here's some of the smf types that we can report on um, and yeah you can see the smf record type 14 uh, the type 15s type 17 so that could be important to you do you want to know what data sets were deleted uh, that is the information that can be passed on to your sim the renaming of data sets I have this particular record type enabled on my sandbox so anytime a job is initiated or ends I get to see that information and you'll see that in the starter task when I show you that so this record type is enabled uh, be in mind my sandbox is pretty small so I don't have everything turned on then there's also the 32s, the termination of a TSO session. Um, it could often be also a 30 as well. I, I heard a story once when I was on uh, one of the share conferences, and this is one way that these folks figured out there was something um, something was happening on their system. There was a guy logging on from some remote foreign IP address at 2 o'clock in the morning, and this is, you know, the detail was all contained in the logs. But maybe this is information that you want logged anytime somebody logs on or logs off your system, perhaps on the weekend. These are all information that can be forwarded off to your enterprise sim. Uh, some of the others, delete members. Uh, the vSIM opens anytime a file is updated. I've seen this quite frequently as well. Rack of events. Oh my goodness, there's, there's so many events to turn on here. And again, this is something that your Rack of folks or your security folks will, you know, figure out what it is that's important to them uh, i haven't included all of this information if you want um, information we can provide you with that detail as to what events are reported but as you can see from events 1 to 89 and also the data types there's a whole bunch of them that you can report from a RACF point of view then also the is uh, this important to you do you want to know when an, a library is apf authorized uh, so this is something that we can report on from a open MVS file system activity, do you know when the file system is mounted or after the file system is QS or suspended? This is just an example of some of the records that we can report on. Um, I know some powerful commands that can be used like the change ownership command or the chown command or change mod. Those are certainly commands that you may want to be made aware of when folks are issuing them on your system. Then also uh, your record, the 102, so those would be the DB2 database ordered ones, uh, the classes 1 to 11, and those would be the admin actions. The 109 would be, which would be your syslog D, so that we can report on those as well. Then also the type 119. Uh, being a network guy, this is the one that I really liked, and there you can see some of them, FTP transfer, client completion. Uh, you can report on those so when somebody stores the file you're going to get a heads up that this file was stored and there you can see some of the other records from a uh, record type 119 perspective then for some of those folks on the call that are top secret and acf2 we we do cater for those we got some fine examples in our manual as well but here you can see also some of them from an acf2 uh, point of view some of the records that can be re reported and also site assigned and also some of the APIs. So all of those are clearly documented. If you want more detail, feel free to reach out to us and we can provide you with that level of detail. Okay, I'm gonna switch to uh, the live demo and I'm gonna switch to TSO. And I have the starter task running on my sandbox here on the STS environment. So let me just upfront tell you, this is a very, very small footprint. Uh, we don't have a lot of events reported on here. Um, we, I am going to migrate this to a few of our production environments later uh, this month or early next month uh, and probably going to turn on a lot more events but this is just going to give you a good feel for what the product can do so that's the starter task that's the name uh, the default name so there's some um, obviously some security work that needs to be done in the background in order for you to get all of this going so I've just selected the, the product and now you can see uh, there's some of the SMF records that uh, did not that's not active on my system like I told you really small sandbox is not a lot of activity going on here and then you can see also this message over here tells you that the smart product is up and ready open for business and ready to be used 
so here you can see I have the product up since the 9th of May um, and that's the time that I fired it up last and this this messages that you are seeing on the log over here I've turned on an operand which I'll show you in a minute or two it's called the right to console operand basically why I did this was when I was testing I wanted to make sure that hey how do I actually know that the events are leaving the type 80 or the smart product and by enabling this operand anytime any message is destined to go to the sim it pops up here as a right to operate the message and now I can see there's that ICH 408 I, uh, 408i message when I try to do something that I wasn't authorized to do there's also some batch jobs that's been run in the background and also some other miscellaneous stuff that's been run so let's go uh, I'm just gonna go all the way down to the bottom and uh, just to show you an example and let's go up a few lines there you can see right now where I'm running this demo uh, the C central time and there you can see some of the information so um, let's go to a just to give you an example this is the batch job that's gonna fail um, it doesn't do anything just allocating something so I'm gonna run that three times and I'm probably gonna get the JCL error 2 on them because that file already exists and if I go back to the um, type 80 product you'll be able to see immediately there those three batch jobs got recorded and now you know this is messages are sent over to the enterprise sim so immediately as they occur they popped up on the log and like remember I told you that's because I have that right to operate the console message turned on so let's go back to um, 3.4 and I just want to show you some of the operands and let's go into the configuration data set just to show you give you a feel for this is the input data set that you get customized and this is where you would turn on the events that we want you that you want to monitor and you also specify if your site is RACF, ACF2 and top secret I'm not going to spend too much time on this just to point out one or two of the important uh, parameters and I'm just going to page down here and let's go here to line 80 this is the address of my enterprise sim and I am using Curator for my example and also the port number that I'm uh, that I'm listening on Then also if I had multiple um, sims I would specify the other addresses remember that's that resilience piece or that redundancy that the product does support and also one of the things to remember is that I'm sending out the log data here in the leaf format and some other one other operand which I spoke about the right to con that's the one that I've turned on to yes which gives me the heads up that messages are being delivered to my sim so let's generate one or two um, events I've already sent some of those batch ones so those are pretty uh, let's see if I can create one and I know that's a PDS of mine um, I'm gonna try and allocate one which I know there is no high level qualifier set to and it's gonna try and update the master catalog and I'm gonna get a ICH 408i message so I'm gonna generate that more than once um, and now what I can do is I can switch to the sim and go and have a look at that information um, just to show you there you can see the two messages they as I did it they popped up on the log in the starter task and now those messages are ready or to be sent to the enterprise sim so I'm gonna log into Curator um, while that's logging I will okay it's gonna load the dashboards and it has been running for some time so I should get some information be in mind I'm only sending data from ZOS uh, it's not like um, those large enterprises that are sending from Windows and Unix and Linux I've only got it set up for Windows at the moment and you'll notice it's pretty consistent throughout um, the the traffic it's showing over here is because I have some automated batch jobs that's running some canned scripts that's been running in the background and they run every 30 minutes or so so that's why you can see the traffic is so um, it's pretty consistent and if I click in the view in the log activity and now I'm gonna go view some of the information that I generated and I think right now I have it set up for destination port but let's change some of the options here let's change that to the last uh, 30 minutes and uh, let's start off with maybe using uh, the low level category so let's have a look 
okay it's just loading and now I can see some of the data it's just loading up for me and I can see some of the information and it looks like there's the access denied uh, looks like insufficient authority two of them was generated um, the time frame I've selected is obviously not long enough there if I click on that and now I can go into some additional detail about what this event is all about so as it loads up I'll be able to see that ICH and be in mind I'm a primarily a ZOS guy um, I'm basically uh, <laughs> Uh, figuring out the curator but yeah you can see bcvr1 that's my user id uh, looks like there was some other access uh, problems earlier and there's the access denied message or that ich408 i message and if i wanted to i can drill down and um, go in some more detail but suffice to say that the folks that know this the curator product or the sim they, you can do some really fancy stuff i was playing around with this where you can set up rules and actions so anytime an event occurs you know you can take certain you can you know do certain things with it and then you can see that's the event that just occurred that's the one that i uh, generated on the system and now you can see you could set up the severity maybe you want to let people know about this but if I drag this to the right hand side, I'll be able to see what this event is all about. And there you can see user BCVR1. Remember, that's the ICH408I message. This is immediately popped up on the sim as the message occurred. And now, you know, you can take certain rules and actions. Perhaps you want to escalate this to one of the networking guys or, your, you know, to figure out what this person was doing. And there are some other information here. You can see the log source is from type 80. So there is some customization required. When I initially set up the SIM, I had to go into the log and tell it where the logs was coming from. Uh, that was all under the admin function. I also had to tell him what type of logs it was. Uh, so there is some customization. What the SIM product does provide for you is we have those QIDs or the curator IDs, which you can load onto your SIM excuse me and that makes it a lot easier for you by loading these um these qids you know that map is going to be there you don't have to go about mapping some of these these classes okay so like i said to you that's a brief overview i could generate some more events but this is just to give you a feel for what the um, the type 80 product or the smart product can do for you all of those smf events that you want recorded or sent to your sim that's going to be available to you and if I close that off just to show you one or two other um, things we can do on the product and, and I think this is just set up right now let's go and view maybe have a look at the high level category information and now you can see a different different uh, setup this looks like it's all access related uh, and there you can also see the IP address and some of the event information about this one uh, user ID which was mine that was caused causing uh, that a ICH408I that console message to be generated um, all right I'm gonna wrap it up now I'm gonna hand it back to Ivan but this is just gives you a good idea uh, of how we can actually send events from ZOS to um, to the um, to the mainframe if I want to do it, actually it looks like I'm getting more data now I've chosen a longer period of time and like I said to you, that's the only one event I've got going here at the moment. Um, okay, so thank you everyone for your time. Uh, we look forward to answering some of those questions that you may have for us. Uh, and I'm going to hand it back to Ivan to wrap up the session. So Ivan, uh, over to you.